Hey, welcome back. Time for another episode of Revenue Optimization Radio. Hosted by Patrick Morrissey, the general manager of Upland Altify, and the sponsor of this program. At Revenue Optimization Radio, we believe the only way to unlock sustained growth is to deliver predictable revenue. We do that by delivering insights, thought leadership, and best practices on how to improve sales velocity. And today, well, today we got a good topic to talk about here. It's one most people kind of skirt around. They don't want to talk about how the revenue team gets lost in translation. Welcome, Patrick. Hey, Paul. Thanks. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Lost in translation. I can't help but think of the Bill Murray movie here that, from a few years ago that got so much uh, play and interesting here, where everybody was just wandering around trying to figure out, what the heck are we doing? That's exactly right, and that's the context to start from. There's a great scene in that movie where Scarlett Johansson is looking at Bill Murray and saying, why don't you just get out of here? <laughs> and, and Bill goes into the whole, well, that's that's going to be a problem because the first thing I'm going to have to do is get off this bar stool, and then I'm going to have to find the elevator, and I'm going to have to find my way out of the building. Yeah. And if I can even do all those things, where would I even go? <laughs> exactly. And I think salespeople are often lost. We have more data then we ever know what to do with. There is a stream of of talk coming at us here about every client, about every prospect, about everything that we're doing. More data than we know what to do with. Who translates that data and turns it into actionable information, much less understands what it is that's saying? Exactly. And what am I supposed to do about it? I had the good fortune. I got to spend yesterday in Atlanta with a Honeywell division doing a, a keynote at their sales kickoff. Right. And it's the Connected Enterprise Group. So they're actually the people who are doing a lot of these IoT and device work. Oh, wow. So all the data that's not just the people data, but all the device data and all the, the systems data. And how do you bring that together? So they're busy sculpting the future. But when you think about how are they going to make very aggressive revenue targets this year, they have the same problem that I think most people have, which is... There's a lot of focus on sales. There's a lot of focus on how do we make the number. Everybody's in the data-driven business, but the big problem is we're all looking at different data, and there's no translation mechanism. There's no filter, and and maybe fundamentally the biggest issue is we really don't understand what the customer wants. No. Well, let's talk about the IoT, Internet of Things, for just a second here. This is the new, brave new world that we're entering into where every appliance in your house or your business is connected to the Internet and telling you something about what it did. The toaster is going to tell you how many pieces of bread it popped up today and whether it was white bread or wheat bread. Okay, fascinating, but what the heck does that mean? And how am I supposed to do any, if I'm trying to sell to a toaster company, I guess if I'm a white bread company and I see they're mostly using white bread, then maybe I can use that data to make my point. But there's probably 10 other competing bits of information that uh, argue the other way here. Nobody knows what to do with this stuff. They don't, and the problem is getting worse, actually, because all the curves about data generation and data consumption go up into the right astronomically, and we still haven't figured out what to do with our CRM data or our marketing data <laughs> right. or you know, our customer data, period. So there's a little bit of not just loss in translation, but I think back to basics that needs to start from, hey, who is the customer and what do I know about them? So let's go backwards a little bit. Let's work the problem backwards. I've asked this question to others and everybody looks at me like a deer in the headlight. So now organizations, your company, your Honeywell, and you're selling to people and you've got access to more data about what the product's doing, how the customer's using it, all these stuff that you're filtering and trying to make sense of here. Whose job is it to sort that data? Is it the marketing department? Is it down to the individual salesperson to take all this raw data and trying to figure out what to do with it? Or do we have to have some sort of data department now that takes this and processes it and translates it into something we can understand? You know what, you're hitting on a very interesting question, and I think there's about three different elements of, of trying to answer it. And if I pull that apart, I think the first thing is we've got a ton of data about customers and markets and segments. I think one of the problems that we sometimes overlook organizationally is, particularly in, in big B2B selling environments, is the customer has just as much data on us mm. and the market mm. and the competition, etc. So we go in thinking all about what's our strategy for the customer, and we blow right past 
what is the customer trying to solve? What do they really need? And what do they know? And how can we help them in their process? So, so we don't ask any questions. We just come in and tell them, hey, we think we can help you because we see you're using more white bread in your toasters and we're the white bread company and here's where we go. Totally. And we don't stop to, to understand the, you know, the people and the problem. So that's one class of problem. The other, another class of problem is the existing data that we have is none of these silos and none of, the, none of this data information is actually talking to us in a way that helps us decode the customer or the prospect. And what I mean by that is if you think about, you know, in a big B2B organization, the names are sometimes changed, but there's some flight plan of how do we go from business development to sales to ultimately getting a commercial agreement done, and then that's going to lead us to finance and operations and, and customer support and customer success. Right. right. There's a path that they follow, a flight, pa- flight path they follow, and, and they're a process to hand it off from one department to the next here. You got it. So the headline problem there is if I'm a customer and I happen to be in the in being looked at from the business development team, I'm a propensity to buy score or a lead score. And then when I get to sales, I'm a forecast probability or I'm a deal size or I'm a weighted, there's some sort of weighting around, you know, am I going to become a customer or not? And then I get to finance and I'm an AOV or I'm a DSO number. Right. And then you get out to customer success and they have an NPS number. How do those things talk to each other in real life? Because they don't have any correlation to each other. I don't know how to take all those different scores and make sense of them. I, I know how to make sense of my internal department. You're a, I'm in sales, so I'm, you're a forecast number to me. But all those other numbers you just rattled off, those other pieces of data, I don't know what they mean to me in sales. Correct, or what they mean to me in marketing or in a whole bunch of these things. So I think there's the data problem here that's the lost in translation issue. And there's a systemic issue that fundamentally, and we've talked about this a little bit before on this, this show, is, and a couple of the guests have talked about it, is the fallacy here is that the customer's at the bottom of the funnel. Like you come in and you're going to go through this process and you pop out of the end and you're you're now a customer, right? right? As opposed to the idea that the customer is actually in the center of the business. The customer is interacting, they're doing their own homework, they're getting their own data, and to the the headline point earlier, they know a hell of a lot more about us than we give them credit for oftentimes. And so if we treat them like a funnel, we're playing upside down. Because there's a whole ton of data that says, from Gartner saying only you know 28% of, of companies are able to maximize revenue in their key accounts, to research we've done that says, hey, 62% of sales means go, you know, get to get past the first call because the customer doesn't seem value. To Forrester, I was talking to some analysts from Forrester last week, and they've been looking at the sales market, and they came back and they're going to publish some research shortly. The net of which is as much as 30% of B2B sales happen where nobody talks to a human. Oh, (laughs) jeez. It's just an order. It's just a machine. You just order something online and it comes, huh? Uh-huh. It's so the Amazon so model here. You're just going to order your uh, your sales services like you order your uh, pizza. That's exactly right. And why would I talk to a human if I didn't have to? So what that means is if you have the relationship, if you understand the customer, if that's their preferred channel, then you just won. Most of the rest of us are on the outside looking in if we don't rethink how do you organize with the customer at the center and then how do you drive not just sales, but sales marketing and everybody else around a set of behaviors that are predicated on a strategy that starts with what problem is the customer trying to solve and how do we help them do it but you've just upended the entire uh, sales process model for the last hundred years this idea of a funnel you gather a bunch of leads some of them uh, proceed down the funnel and as they do they get closer and closer at the end you spit out a sale it's a it's a sausage making machine you know, input uh, customers output sales and you just take them through through the process was the idea. Like, go back to your airline analogy. They're just passengers on a plane. They board the, you get them to board the plane, and then you fly them somewhere. You feed them. You entertain them. You process their baggage, and in the end, you say, uh, "Have a nice. I hope you had a nice flight, and I hope you come back again." Yeah, and it's troubling also when you zoom out that you know part of the reality of, of that that frames this entire conversation from a market point of view actually goes back to I, I think actually whose fault it really is is Mark Andreessen's fault. And let me tell you why. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I think the through line. Mark, you're welcome to, to come on and you know and argue this point if you want to if you want to defend yourself anytime here. Exactly. We would like to have uh, you know the in- inventor of the of the browser and really unlocking all the data 
from the internet into something that was broadly applicable to everybody else. And what he famously said in 2011 in a Wall Street Journal article is software is eating the world. And in the future, everyone is going to become a software company. Yeah. And I think he's absolutely right. 100 percent right. And you need to look no further than just Tesla disrupting the car industry. Exactly. I grew up in the car business. My dad was an executive for Chrysler. Everybody I knew worked in the car business and they were car guys. They were engineers. They knew how to tinker with machines and motors and, and it was nuts and bolts and everything. And a few years ago, Ford famously said to remember the Ford family was running, I think Bill Ford or whatever at the time said, we are no longer an engine manufacturer. We're, we're no longer a, a tool and die company. We're a software company. The software just happens to sit on a mechanical platform. But it, but what we're all about is software. Anybody can make the gears. Anybody can make the wheels. Anybody can make the motors. That's not what differentiates us. That's exactly right. And I think the part that gets missed in that, well, one, some people still haven't come to that realization that they're in the data business, they're in the software business. But if you're in that business, by definition, you're in a subscription model now. Yeah. which means, right. and, the, and the economics of a subscription model are predicated on lifetime value. You never, most, most companies don't make money in the first year. They make money in the out years, right. two, three, four, five, six, right? The, the movie model, you, you spend more to make that series. It's only when it goes to syndication over a period of time or gets sold to Netflix and it used to be video, but whatever else they sell it to, that's where the money, that's where you recoup coop your investment here, not just the initial production and sale. I'll give you another interesting thing. So to your point, we do a show here on the network um, called Driven by Design, and it's with a car designer, former 10-year uh, veteran of Nissan's uh, car design studio. Mm -hmm. And he's talked a great deal about cars the future may just be rentable appliances. You subscribe to a Tesla. You don't buy a Tesla anymore. You don't even rent it or lease it or anything here. You just have a subscription and they bring you a car. Maybe there's a variety of cars. Maybe he said, I think it was Volvo or somebody's experiment with this. Today, what should we bring you this week? You want to drive this model? Great. Uh, next week, we'll bring you a different model here. You, it's just a subscription. And for that, you get to spend so many hours in one of our vehicles here. That's a radically different way of looking at the world. It really is, and there's a whole bunch of ramifications to that, and I think that that notion of consumption and really anything on demand and anything in a subscription is very much the way the world's going, because right now you can do one of the interesting variations on that same theme is you can do that with Fender guitars. So they will actually ship you guitars, and part of it is you get a digital subscription that teaches you how to play guitar and, that, and gives you additional you know, music options and so right. on, too, on the premise that as you get more, if we can help you be more proficient and teach you how to use these things, then you're going to have more appreciation of them and say, hey, some things are better on an, an electric or... Yeah, or acoustic or whatever. You're going you're gonna to use it more. You're going to get a better product here. Or what if we don't buy anything anymore? Everything we just subscribe to. So the car analogy again, or the guitar analogy here. As long as I want to play guitar, they'll send me guitars and they'll keep updating it and replacing the software in it or replacing the strings. Or uh, People do that now with copiers where you don't actually buy or own the copier anymore. Some company brings it to you and they charge you for how many pages you use. And when you're done, they come pick up their copier. That's exactly right. And But then if you rewind back to a sales motion, how many sales motions and how many organizations actually script their customer journey based on a renewal that's or starts from a re renewal in year five? Right? If <laughs> nobody. You worked nobody. From, <laughs> if you worked your way back from not just what is, how do we make the number, but get more specifically into, okay, what does the future look like? What does our ideal customer look like? And then what if we orchestrated this journey not from where they started, but let's orchestrate this journey from how have we served and helped and enabled their business five years down the line and work our way back from, hey, where do we go from here? Yeah, well, in the same way that, was it uh, Gibson Guitars that wants to just teach you how to play the guitar in the hope that you'll keep buying guitars or when buying and renting them, uh, subscribing to their guitar service here. And the more they can do to teach you to be better at it and enjoy it better here, the more you'll stay with them forever here. Fascinating conversation. We've got to take a quick break and come back with more uh, talking about the, what you're really talking about is a future revolution in sales here, not just built around the data and what to do with it, but looking at the end goal, is it just to complete that one sale or is it to create an ongoing subscription, an ongoing relationship with that customer that maybe doesn't start paying off for years to come? That's an amazing mind bending uh, thought and we'll uh, let everybody ponder that as we come back with a commercial here. 
All right. If that hasn't uh, confused or blown your mind enough here, then uh, we want to give you something, one way to make it easier. And that is that you really should be listening to Altify. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in great depth here, but stick with us. We're going to have a commercial from in just a second here. You're only successful as your customers, and that demands the need for an exceptional sales execution, revenue retention, and customer success. The challenge for most sales leaders and their teams, however, is that their sales process just doesn't match how their customers buy. Sustained growth isn't possible because the revenue team isn't aligned with customers and prospects. With Altify's sales transformation solutions, companies can deliver predictable revenue growth. Yes, we said predictable revenue growth. They can also acquire and retain customers, and they can collaborate across the revenue team to qualify and win new business while delivering value that unlocks cross-sell and upsell opportunities. Built natively on the Salesforce platform, Altify helps salespeople, managers, and executives achieve sustained revenue growth. They help accelerate sales performance for Autodesk, Comcast, GE, Honeywell, Salesforce, Tableau, and United Healthcare. They can do the same for you. Visit Altify.com, just like it sounds, A-L-T-I-F-Y, Altify.com. Well, that commercial says it all, doesn't it? It really is. We're not aligned with what the customer wants and the process. We're just coming in trying to sell them something here. That's right, and that is a recipe for disaster. And I think really the thing, you know, coming back to the the lost in translation problem is really starting to rethink the entirety of the journey, but actually it's really a set of behaviors and you know, a great example of that and I you know, primer when I look at who does this well and who who thinks about these things differently is I look at somebody who who has a best in class sales team like Workday. And when you talk to the, you know, the leadership at Workday, what they talk about is we need to be in a outside-in mindset. We need to get out of the we're trying to sell something, but we need to you know, flip this around and say, what does the customer really need? Where are they coming from? What are they trying to do for their customers and their markets? What is it that we can help them with that's going to help us deeply understand and work with the entire team so we become you know, the ERP and the system of record? And if we understand them deeply and we take this from a what's what's the customer need, what's their strategy, how do we help them and work it back to how do we present you know capabilities to support that, we're gonna win. And we're gonna win not just because, hey, we've got the best in class technology, but we're gonna win because we understand them deeply and that puts us in a in a different position to engage them as a partner to help them execute on their goals. I get what you're saying, but I'm trying to think of, we've talked about this before, Altify, your company. So you guys mm-hmm. work within the Salesforce platform. Because I've used the Salesforce platform. Everybody on the planet's used the Salesforce platform. And it's a great in-depth CRM system. It's a place to collect lots of data. The last time I called them, what they said, I can make notes and other sorts of things and whatnot. It's almost just like a giant note keep. I'm, I'm, I'm over uh, oversimplifying this, but it's a way to keep track of the conversation of that funnel as it goes along. But it doesn't give me any insight into them unless I physically get that insight and enter it in there. The system itself doesn't prompt me to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, what are they really looking for? Uh, how does their process work? What kinds of things are they transitioning to? And how can I help them make that transition to as they change their business model how can i it, i don't remember any questions in there where it says how can i help the customer yeah exactly there's even not not even much good questions or much things that gets into how can i help the sales rep just figure yeah. out what the hell's going on <laughs> right. I, I think the the answer to your question paul which is a, a great one is fundamentally the differentiation and what we're trying to do is provide more insight and benefit to the not just the sellers but the entire revenue team than what they put in and it's all about visualizing the people and the problems whether you think about that in context of i'm trying to get this deal done or you think about this in context of a big account where you might have a collection of opportunities from the people perspective what we are able to do is take contact records that exist in like the manager field the reports to field in salesforce Mm -hmm. and actually visualize them and display criteria about who they are, how much coverage have we had with them, who owns the relationship inside of our account, 
so that we can visualize not just the account hierarchy, but we can start to color code, um, you know, green, red, yellow in terms of are they a supporter or a mentor or a fan? Are they selling for us and are they on side versus their yellow, which is some version of we're in process or we don't know. Right. Or, or they're, you know, they're neutral, but particularly in a buying cycle, somebody who's neutral doesn't say neutral for long or they're red. They're either not on side, they're not aware of us, and or they're biased to another vendor, another approach, or, or even other projects, and they're selling against us. Yeah, so right. half of that equation is not just be able to bring an org chart to life, but really to be able to help the entire revenue team architect and influence strategy. Almost sounds like a football plan, the way they break down uh, wide receivers and does he break to the left, does he break to the right, uh, so you can predict what he's going to do here and have some insight when you throw the ball, where to, where to throw it here. Correct, and you can also get some insight on who else is on the field because it's not the people that are you're talking to that end up screwing up your deal. It's the people you don't know, you can't see, and you haven't accounted for. Boy, isn't that the truth? You think you got uh, Joe on board here? He's supposed to be the buyer for this product here or service, and all of a sudden Joe calls you up and says, "I got overruled by Tom or Sue or somebody else here." That's right. So we help visualize that and get everybody on the team understanding how to navigate the organization at scale. So you might have you know relationship maps with hundreds of people on them because there's a lot of people involved in some of these decisions. The other side of the equation is mapping specifically to what do they care about? So what we have is what we call an insight map, which is a little bit like if you've ever walked into a war room or an office for some sort of a deal and they put up a you know, whiteboard with a bunch of sticky notes on it yeah, and they're right. moving around and where are the priorities. What we help visualize is what are the goals? So what are the outcomes the customer is looking for? What are the pressures? So what keeps them from getting what they want? And what are the, the inside the building and the market, the outside, the external forces that are putting pressure on their ability to execute, which then gets down into initiatives? So where are they investing and what projects are we aligned to? And then what are the obstacles? What have we determined in our discovery that says, here's a problem we can solve? And the bottom of that map is a space that, that's left for the revenue team to actually put in their solutions. Whether we're presenting you know, account and opportunity management in our case, or we might be proposing content operations plays for them to help them really orchestrate that customer journey. Or we might have, you know, in the case of Workday, the entire suite of the Workday ERP. But the aha of that is now I have one page in Salesforce that, that's exportable where I can sit down in front of the customer and say, this is what we understand about you and what's important. Do we have it right? Yeah, right. And that's really the core of decoding the lost in translation problem. If I am able to effectively validate with you as the CEO of a, of a large organization or a senior executive that we understand your goals, your priorities. And, and your problems priorities. maybe within your organization, yeah and who owns them and what success looks like, we are having a fundamentally different conversation than we've got really great tech and you need some. Yeah. Wow, boy, I, it's just I, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go replay this one and play it a few more times because you're talking about completely rethinking the way the game is played. Well, I think that that's happening. You're playing money time. ball, as they say on baseball here, instead of uh, instead of just uh, in, instinctually saying, "Get up there and hit one for us here." You know what? You're on to something there. I need to think a little bit harder and play that whole thing out because you know everybody wants to be the Kevin Euclid of sales. You know, they want right. to have they may they may regardless of how they look, if they just outperform at the plate, everybody pays attention. And yeah. in this case, it really comes down to rethinking the art of the possible and getting getting out of your own way and getting into the mindset of the customer. Well, I think you're onto something there and i think we should do a show on that you're you're the money ball of uh, sales here you're you're trying to use data and and insights to uh, drive decisions rather than you're trying to tell a story with data one and you're trying to understand relationships and how the organization that you're trying to enter functions rather than just get in front of somebody and pitch them something that's right. And it all comes back to, very simply, putting the customer at the center and assuming that they know a lot, assuming they have as much or more data about you as you have about them, and really thinking deeply about how do we help them move the needle? Because if you can come at it with that mindset, then you're going to win, and you're going to win big. All right. Well, if they want to move the needle, if they want to hear more about this, how do they get in touch with you guys? They can find us at Altify.com and also the Upland software, which we're now a part of. So if you went to UplandSoftware.com, you can find a whole breadth of capabilities around revenue optimization for sales process, for opportunity management, for account planning, for content operations, for proposal management, and more. 
we're all about trying to help best in class revenue teams with not just the tools, but the mindset, the strategy, the methodology to help them be successful and help them over index for their customers. Well, it's a brave new world we're entering into. The customers are having to change the way they're selling or what they're selling. Maybe they're selling subscriptions instead of products, and we need to do the same. Absolutely. That's where the high ground is. All right. Thanks for opening our eyes. I look forward to more insights as we continue this conversation into the new year and the new decade here. You bet. Thanks for your time, Paul. Have a great day and a great week. All right. Wow. Well, you've been listening to another fascinating conversation from Revenue Optimization Radio with your host, Patrick Morrissey, right here in the Funnel Radio Network for at-work listeners like you. 